Chapter 9, Section 5, The Gilded Age. In 1873, the writer Mark Twain co-authored a book about rich industrialists and corrupt politicians called The Gilded Age. Something that is gilded looks like gold, but only on the outside. The title described American society in this period well. Industrialists who'd made great fortunes led glittering lives, but beneath that glitter, this period was marked by political corruption and social unrest. From industrialist to philanthropist. During the Gilded Age, the growth of three industries fueled a rapid expansion of the American economy. From 1870 to 1900, steel production rose from 77,000 tons to more than 11 million tons. Oil production swelled from around 5 million barrels annually to more than 63 million barrels. Railroad track expanded from 53,000 to around 200,000 miles. From these industries, three towering figures emerged, Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Cornelius Vanderbilt. All three started as entrepreneurs, bold risk-takers who established new businesses. Along the way, they amassed huge fortunes. In 1890, Carnegie earned $25 million. That year, the average industrial worker made about $440. Carnegie lived in a four-story, 64-room mansion on Millionaire's Row in New York City. Workers near his Pittsburgh mill lived in cramped, poorly ventilated rooms with primitive sanitation. This huge gap in living standards did not bother most industrialists. Some would have explained it as social Darwinism in action. Others might have said that by working hard and following Carnegie's example, anyone could be rich. Carnegie's rags to riches story supported such views. After arriving from Scotland in 1848 at the age of 12, he worked in a Pennsylvania cotton mill earning $1.20 a week. His thrift and shrewd investments gave him a $50,000 in annual income by the time he was 30. Through a combination of daring business tactics and technological innovations, Carnegie prospered and gained control of several steel plants. In 1889, the year before his income hit $25 million, he published an article titled Wealth. In it, he declared that rich people had a duty to use their surplus wealth for the improvement of mankind. He added, a man who dies rich dies disgraced. Carnegie set a splendid example by using his fortune to benefit society. In 1911, he established the Carnegie Corporation of New York. This charitable foundation offered grants of money to promote the advancement of knowledge. It focused on education, especially libraries. Carnegie helped build more than 2,500 free public libraries throughout the world. He also used his money to support cultural institutions and to promote international peace. Like Carnegie, Rockefeller had the foresight to get in on the ground floor of an industry with a bright future. He started with one oil refinery, which he built into a huge corporation, Standard Oil. Rockefeller's monopolistic approach to business brought him fabulous wealth and a terrible reputation. In an era of tough competition, he stood out for his ruthless tactics. However, like Carnegie, he became a philanthropist, a person who gives money to support worthy causes. He used his fortune to help establish the University of Chicago in 1892. He also started several charitable organizations, including the Rockefeller Foundation. Through these organizations, he supported medical research, education, and the arts. Cornelius Vanderbilt followed a similar path to wealth. In 1810, at age 16, he started the ferry business in New York Harbor. Later, he built up a fleet of steamships. By upgrading his ships and cutting shipping rates, he prospered. Ambitious and clever, Vanderbilt mastered the world of trade and transportation. He set up a profitable route from New York to San Francisco in time to carry many 49ers to the gold fields. In 1862, he sold his steamer business and invested in railroad stock. He soon owned several rail lines, opening the first direct service from New York City to Chicago. Unlike Carnegie and Rockefeller, however, Vanderbilt never believed he had a duty to use his wealth to benefit society. Nevertheless, in 1873, he donated $1 million to found Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Robber Barons or Captains of Industry History is not quite sure how to judge the business giants of the Gilded Age. Critics call them robber barons for the way they gained their wealth and the lordly style in which they lived. Supporters call them Captains of Industry, who, despite some shady dealings, helped usher in our modern economy. From the critics' point of view, the industrialists prospered for mostly negative reasons. They ruthlessly drove rivals out of businesses and raised prices by limiting competition. They robbed the nation of its natural resources and bribed officials to ensure their success. They kept wages low and imposed dreadful working conditions while trying to squeeze every ounce of work out of their employees. 
Supporters argue, however, that industrialists prospered for mostly positive reasons. They worked hard and took advantage of new technology. Industrialists found new ways to finance and organize businesses for greater efficiency and productivity. And their success created jobs for millions of Americans. Shopkeepers, doctors, lawyers, and others in the growing middle class profited from the upsurge in business. Their living standards climbed along with the rising economy. But it would take years of struggle before workers shared in these benefits. As you'll read in the next chapter, perhaps the greatest inequality in American history occurred during the Gilded Age. This debate about the overall impact of the industrialists may never be resolved, but one thing is clear. The industrial expansion of the late 1800s helped give rise to a vibrant economy and consumer society. Americans had access to an unprecedented abundance of goods and services, and they kept demanding more. By the early 1900s, economic growth had helped make the United States one of the most powerful nations in the world.